All right, my friends, I've spent a lot of time with the Turbo Graphics 16 Mini, and I thought it was time for me to do mini reviews of every single game that's included in this hardware. And there are a lot of them. There are about 60 different games because there's some hidden ones in here. So I've got to get into these things fairly quickly, and I'm not going to spend tons of time with them. I wasn't around for the Turbo Graphics 16 when it first launched. I didn't have this machine, so I'm not you know, the expert on every one of these games. I'm only giving you my opinions on what I've played so far and what I've been able to experience with this hardware. And overall, I gave this machine a nine if you saw my review of the uh, platform itself. I am very, very impressed with the software and the hardware that this device delivers to us. All right, let's get started, and I'm going to do this alphabetically, and I'm going to start with the Turbo Graphics 16 games. We're starting with Air Zonk, which was a 1992 Hudson Soft game, and you're going to hear the name Hudson Soft a lot because Hudson uh, was the partner with NEC on uh, providing the software and a lot of the experiences with the Turbo Graphics 16 and also the PC Engine, as it was called in Japan. Air Zonk is a, uh, a very cute, uh, crazy shooter experience where you play this little um, this little warrior that's flying around in the sky and blasting at all kinds of crazy bad guys. You're collecting happy faces. It's very cute. It's very colorful. It's very easy to play. I think this one's a winner. I'm giving it an 8.5 out of 10. Second one up is Alien Crush. This one was developed by Hudson Soft in 1988. It's a pinball game, and it's uh, kind of got that H.R. Geiger kind of uh, alien movie kind of vibe going for it. Alien, the film, the Ridley Scott classic, was such an influential piece of media. It infiltrated all kinds of video games, and here it is again. It's not quite Alien, but it has the, you know, the retractable heads and the jaws and the snapping, and it's a gooey, squishy kind of vibe. You've got lots of targets that you have to hit, and you've got bonus areas areas that you try to get into to up your score. Uh, it's actually got some pretty decent physics, and I recall being very unimpressed playing Sonic Spinball on the Sega Genesis. This is a much cooler game. Alien Crush, I'm giving an 8 out of 10. Number three is the first of the real space shooters that I'm going to be talking about, and I'll have a bunch of them on this machine to talk about. This is Blazing Lasers. It came out in 1989 from Hudson Soft, and this one uh, has some voice uh, over bits telling you what power-ups you've picked up. It's a vertical scrolling shooter. You're blasting at little tiny brains and things that are exploding all over the place. It was super fast and fun, uh, but maybe not the one with the most character when you compare it to lots of the other shooter experiences that are on this piece of hardware. I'm going to give Blazing Lasers a 7 out of 10. Fourth one up is Bomberman 93, developed by Hudson Soft in 93. It was uh, a creation of Hudson Soft's, and we all know the Bomberman gameplay. You've got to blow up all kinds of little squishy bosses. They're, it's always very cutesy. Reminded me a little of the uh, WarioWare, Mega Man type of aesthetic. But don't be fooled. This is a very challenging game that asks you to defeat an, a screen and wipe out all the bad guys and get to the end with one life because if you die if you blow yourself up which is very easy to do you got to start the whole thing over again still classic gameplay super fun and a great addition to this collection 8.5 out of 10. Number five is Bonk's Revenge. This one came out in 1991 from Hudson Soft, and this one is loaded with all kinds of cutesy detail. It looks like a super slick NES game. This is a, uh, a sequel. I don't know if it's two or three, but they'd already developed Bonk's already. This was sort of uh, capitalizing on the success of previous Bonk's experiences. Uh, it's super fast. It's loaded with lots of great little details. You're eating butterflies and flowers, and uh, there's all kinds of fruit to pick up. When you eat the meat, though, you go crazy. You become... A, 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 an insane creation that's got steam coming out of your ears and you can go and thrash all the bad guys. Very, very addictive and fun uh, platforming action experience. And of, of course the Bonk games are going to be included on a TurboGrafx-16 collection. I love this game. I'm giving it a 9 out of 10. Number 6 is Kadash. This was originally developed by Taito and brought to the TurboGrafx-16 by Working Designs in 1991. You got a bunch of different warrior tropes. You've got a fighter, you've got a priest, you've got a mage, you've got a ninja and it's a, a scrolling kind of hack and slasher but it's clunky and the visuals are kind of dated um, so I, and it's also more suited to play with somebody else but of course I've only got the one controller so my kid couldn't join me in playing this one I didn't have the greatest time with it and I felt like it was constantly fighting me to you know with challenge and sort of getting in my way of having any fun with it there are way better scrolling brawler beat-em-ups in the kind of eight to 16-bit world out there. Um, Kadash, 
I would not play this game too much. I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10. Number 7 was an awesome surprise. It's called Chu Man Fu, also developed by Hudson Soft in 1990. And this is kind of like a Pengo Bomberman style game where you have to clear, you know, screens and you get to the next screen. Uh, you play a couple of little cutesy roundish characters that are moving balls around and you got to roll them over the bad guys and get them onto the colored switches to uh, get past a screen and go on to the next one. It's kind of addictive. I mean, it, you, you're, you can grab the, the ball and swing it around corners and then kick it so it smushes the bad guys uh, and you can also get trapped like in Bomberman. Definitely a weird quirkiness, uh, you know, uh, but there's something really addictive and fun about it. It's also a multiplayer game and you can edit your own screens. You can actually play through that stuff as well. Chu Man Fu was a great surprise. I'm giving it an 8.5 out of 10. Number eight is Dungeon Explorer from Atlas and Hudson Soft in 1989. And this is a great game. It's definitely in the vein of the classic Gauntlet. You've got a bunch of different uh, uh, character types that are like ripped right out of the pages of D&D books. You've got uh, gnomes, warlocks, witches, elves, bishops, thieves, bards, or fighters. And it's a multiplayer experience at its core. This is a game that you'd want the turbo tap for and you'd want uh, people to play with you. It's very hard to play alone because the bad guys all swarm you and surround you and it's very tricky and you're basically going into dungeons and and uh, as the name implies exploring them and blasting at all kinds of bad guys and finding the loot and the treasure it's pretty solid but uh, it definitely loses something um, when you're playing it alone so uh, based on my solo play time with this game I'd give it a 7.5 out of 10. Number nine is JJ and Jeff, developed by Hudson Soft and brought out in 1990. This is based on um, some quirky Japanese personalities. They're playing detectives in here. There's a rich guy that gets kidnapped and they got to go on the case to go and save him by punching fences and bees and jumping over things. And everything in the world seems to hurt these characters. And, you know, so it's got kind of a, 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 a tedious difficulty and a kind of sloppy collision. It's just not that fun to play. As quirky as it is, as cool looking as it is to have these giant headed little uh, avatars that we get to control, I was just not having a good time with this game. And maybe it's because I know nothing about the actual JJ and Jeff, uh, but this one, I'd, I'd probably skip this one. I'm going to give it a 4 out of 10. Number 10 is Lords of Thunder by Hudson Soft and brought out in 1993, which was late in the uh, Turbo Graphics 16's lifespan. And it shows this is a very sophisticated game. I've heard that it doesn't run quite the way that people played it, uh, who played it originally, remember it. I've never played it before. I was blown away. Elemental warriors that you can control, fire, wind, uh, yeah, earth, and uh, water. Uh, they've got elemental powers. You're going to be fighting giant, ferocious fire beasts and all kinds of great characters. Um, there's a lot of flash, a lot of sizzle, fantastic heavy metal music in this game as well. Very challenging, but very cool. It's got kind of a roguelike quality to it as well. You spend on a bunch of power-ups before you start your run, and you earn, and then you can go back and spend again and try it again. Um, it's very addictive. This was one of the best surprises that I found on the TurboGrafx-16 Mini. I'm giving it a 9 out of 10. Number 11 is Military Madness, which came out in 1989, developed by Surprise, Hudson Soft again. And uh, this is a lot like Advance Wars. I think it predated Advance Wars. It's a turn-based strategy experience where it's grid-based and you're trying to kind of take over these hexagons and defeat the enemy. You're a couple of armies fighting on the moon. You've got infantry characters, you've got tanks, you've got all kinds of other units and you're going up head to head. They have cut sequences where we actually go to the battle sequence just like in Advance Advance Wars. It's very, you know, early days looking, but the core gameplay is definitely fun and addictive, and it's a great addition on the TurboGrafx-16 Mini. I'm going to give it a 7.5 out of 10. Number 12 is Moto Raider. This came out in 1989 from NEC and NCS, and uh, it looks like it's going to be a fun game. It's a top-down racing game, but it's terrible. It's such a totally frustrating experience to play. They have a warp mode attached to these cars that keeps all four of the vehicles on the track at the same time. There's a bunch of different tracks that you can play, but they all look the same because you only get a, you know, a tiny little section of the road that you can see, and you've got to press up and down or whatever, left or right, to kind of turn the car uh, kind of tank style. It's not elegant. It's not fun to play. And that stupid warp thing just is so confusing because you're constantly seeing your car get whoop, 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 dragged along. Terrible game. Two out of ten. 
Number 13 is Newtopia, developed by Hudson Soft, came out in 1990. This is a Zelda clone. You play this hero named Gisetta, and you've got to go and explore a huge overworld and get into dungeons and fight all kinds of bad guys, and you talk to all kinds of townspeople and people that give you uh, power-ups and hints and stuff. It's very Zelda-like, but it's kind of majestic and epic, and it kind of pulls you in, for sure, you know? It's not like... Uh, playing Zelda clones, you're always thinking of Zelda, but it's not like playing Zelda clones is a drag because Zelda laid out the groundwork for fantastic gameplay. And Utopia definitely follows the map and borrows liberally on established tropes and ideas, but it's still a lot of fun to play. It gets an 8 out of 10 from me. A year later, Hudson Soft brought us Newtopia 2, which is number 14 on this list, and uh, you can feel everything got a little crisper, a little tighter. You actually play the son of Gisetta, and you're trying to go and so if, save the original hero and track down, you know, the, the mystery of what, what his disappearance. And it's also very, very inviting and very addictive, tight mechanics and a fun, expansive world that you're going to want to go and explore. Newtopia 2 is a little bit better than Newtopia 1, go figure. I'm giving it an 8.5 out of 10. Number 15 is New Adventure Island from Hudson Soft, came out in 1992. You can see Hudson Soft kind of, uh, you know, flexing a little bit here. The sprites are huge. The character work is awesome. There's some great cut sequence bits in here. It's super funny. I mean, the, this sort of jungle guy is getting married and the wife gets kidnapped and you got to go and rescue the, the wife. And the first thing you do is you hop on a skateboard and grab a, a boomerang and you're just throwing, you're, you know, you're throwing your boomerang at all kinds of jungle creatures and stuff. It, it, I don't know what it is, but back then, back in the 80s and 90s, getting on skateboards and getting boomerangs were the coolest things you could do in video games. And that's well established in this one. Uh, it's got a quirky charm. It's definitely worth playing. I'm going to give New Adventure Island a 7.5 out of 10. Number 16 is Ninja Spirit. It was developed by Irem, came out in 1990, and I think this might be my favorite game in the whole collection. You uh, play a ninja, and you've got all kinds of other ninjas that are coming out to get you, whether they're popping up from the floorboards or from either sides of the screen. You're scrolling along, and you pick up all kinds of great mystical power-ups that give you great uh, abilities, but one of the coolest ones is this opportunity to clone yourself multiple times, and suddenly it's just a you know, a cascade of cool ninjas flying around, whipping and slicing through all kinds of bad guys and you know, eventual massive bosses. Very slick game, very addictive, and a great addition in this collection. 9.5 out of 10 for me. Number 17 is Parasol Stars, the story of Bubble Bobble 3. This was uh, published by Working Designs. Taito uh, was the developer, came out in 1991 on the TurboGrafx-16. And uh, this is, uh, a cre you know, again, crazy big sprites, lots of character, lots of... Uh, cutesy little bad guys that you have to defeat like lions and unicorns and stuff and you've got you're a big umbrella and you're picking up all kinds of balls that you're gonna blast at the bad guys and it's kind of like playing the classic mario brothers game where they just had the platforms and you're jumping up back and forth and trying to knock everybody down it's a little bit like that but you're using the bubble bobble mechanics uh and it's fun it's definitely cutesy it's definitely um hooky uh and i dug it i'm giving it a 7.5 out of 10. Number 18 is Power Golf, developed by Hudson Soft, came out in 1989, and this is a pretty dry golf game. We've had so many excellent golf games over the years, lots of great retro ones. This one is definitely playable. The timing is tricky on, uh, you know, on the swing meter. Um, it's also got a tricky menu interface. The first time I, I, uh, I started up this game, I actually loaded up a game for my daughter to play, and she was playing as the computer, because that's one of the choices. You can watch the computer play, and she thought, man, I am really good at this game and it wasn't until later that I realized that I pressed the wrong thing um, so it's a bit it's a bit quirky um, but certainly playable it's just not incredibly memorable I'm giving power golf a 5 out of 10 now there are a lot of shooters on the turbo graphics 16 mini and uh, lots of clever ideas when it comes to shooters one of them is psychosis this was developed by Naxat and published by NEC in 1990 and the whole idea here is you're having some kind of hallucinogenic uh, uh, kind of episode and so you're uh, you're flying around and you're blasting at uh, like giant floating eyeballs there's lots of little squishy elements in the background everything starts off as if it's a case and it's got a cooler idea than you know what is represented here like you'll be starting off in squishy areas and and uh 
disturbing imagery will be in the background and then eventually you'll be flying over what looks like a Tetris world or something like that. So there's, uh, you know, lots of different kinds of flavors to what you're going to be seeing, but the gameplay itself is just not as refined and as fun as a lot of the other shooters that you're going to be able to play on this thing. I'm going to give Psychosis a 6 out of 10. And speaking of essential shooters, R-Type is on here, developed by Irem, came out in 1989. This has been a classic essential shooter for tons of different consoles out there. It's an excellent conversion for the TurboGrafx-16. Very fast, very playable, very fluid, lots of great technology coming your way, uh, you know, sort of understanding the intricacies of uh, when and where to use your charge beam attacks and all the power-ups that you're going to collect. This is wonderful, wonderful stuff, and it is an excellent addition to this great lineup of awesome shooters. Even still, it stands out. R-Type gets a 9 out of 10. And now we're getting into some really tasty shooters. 21 is Soldier Blade. It came out in 1992, and it's developed by Hudson Soft again. This is a vertical shooter. You're flying over giant capital ships. There's a lot of, like, metallic technology that you're blasting away at. Mechs and other fighter jets and lots of cool power-ups for you to pick up. Your ship is the perfect size, so it's very nimble and very fluid. It's very easy to get through. Well, it's not easy. It's hard. There's a lot of challenge coming in here, but it's it feels like you have great control control over your craft, which is very important because the uh, the challenge is high and the consequences are dire. Um, this is a, a game that came later in the life cycle of the TurboGrafx-16, and by this point, Hudson had made tons of shooters, and it shows. It's not the best one. It doesn't have the coolest, uh, you know, character or the most memorable design elements, but it's certainly very, very confident and very fun to play. It gets an 8.5 out of 10 for me. Number 22 is Space Harrier, which is a 1986 Sega arcade game. It was uh, ported and published by NEC, and they've done a pretty admirable job at creating that pseudo 3D effect of racing into the uh, into the screen and having everything come out at you kind of 3D style. Um, it, you know, definitely some stripped down kind of elements in here because the TurboGrafx-16 had a uh, an 8-bit CPU, uh, but still, it looks almost as good as what was achievable on the Sega Genesis, but I'm not a crazy big fan of this. I think it was an amazing arcade experience back in the 80s because it emulated the idea of 3D, but we've just played so many awesome actual 3D games by this point that when you see this, it just feels... Uh, it feels gimmicky, and it feels light and lean. I think it's good for curiosity's sake. It's just not a game I would go back to. So I give Space Harrier for the TurboGrafx-16 Mini a 5 out of 10. Number 23 is Splatterhouse. This is an old Namco arcade experience brought to the TurboGrafx in 1990 by NEC. And uh, you, you know the deal here. You play a serial killer, and you got to kill a bunch of aliens and squish them. And they're barfing on you, and they're, just, they're, they're exploding into piles of goo. Sometimes you're in the water. Sometimes you're in creaky kind of haunted house things. You've got wrenches and stuff that you can throw. Uh, there's all kinds of little elements that will come out and try to hit you in the head. Uh, it didn't really make a lot of sense when I've ever played Splatterhouse games before, and I've never been one that has been like, oh my god, have you played Splatterhouse? I know there's a lot of big fans out there, but I've played way better beat-em-ups than this, and, uh, I, you know, honestly, I just... I'm not that impressed. I'm impressed that the port is solid and uh, there's definitely some enjoyment here, but it's it's outclassed by way too many 16-bit brawlers out there and, and beat-em-ups. I give Splatterhouse for the TurboGrafx-16 Mini a 7 out of 10. Number 24 is a racing game. It's called Victory Run and it came out in 1989, uh, developed by Hudson Soft again. And uh, this is a kind of a cool idea. It reminded me a little bit of Enduro, a classic Atari 2600 game from uh, Activision, where it feels like the race is never going to end. But certainly you can feel the um, influence of OutRun on this game as well. It's kind of like a cutesy OutRun. Uh, the, you know, again, fairly decent effect of having vehicles come at you in 3D. You're basically just having to shift into the right gear and avoid all of the obstacles that are coming your way. You also have the propensity to have uh, elements of your car, your your wheels, your shocks, your, your uh, gear shift. They start to break down. So you buy a lot of these things and you kind of repair them at the different checkpoints that you're racing to get to. Um, and it's, you know, pretty cool idea. It's just very dated technology at this point. And, it, you know, we've been, we've been inundated with excellent racing games over the years. So this feels 
there's not that compulsive pull to go back to this. I'm going to give it a 5.5 out of 10. At number 25, and this is the last of the English language TurboGrafx-16 games on this machine. It's Ease Book 1 and 2, uh, developed by Falcom in 1987-88 uh, and brought to the TurboGrafx-16 by Hudson Soft in 1989. And it was actually brought as a CD-ROM game, collecting both uh, book one and book two and uh, you can uh, you know th this is a game that's massive and there's been several iterations of this and lots of different sequels and things I've never played an ease game and I know that my buddy Johnny Millennium is a huge fan of this franchise so but I was a little overwhelmed honestly when I jumped in I thought it was going to be so difficult to get into and and maybe old and clunky feeling but it actually is pretty fast it's an action role-playing experience but one of the weird things about this game is that you don't really take control of the character in combat you just run into your enemies and it's based on you know the stats of your of your confrontation whether or not you're going to survive or not and also the angle that you go in on attack on um, and I didn't know that and so it was very weird I had my my sword and my shield and my armor and I just walked into bad guys and I was able to defeat them and get past them and into dungeons and collect some loot and stuff. I didn't get too far into this game, but I was certainly impressed by, um, you know, the epic quality of it and the storytelling that was happening between characters and, and uh, the beautiful music and the voice acting, all the stuff that sort of embellished the core experience to make it seem like a massive escape you know and I can certainly kind of place myself back in this era in 1989 I if I had played this back then my mind would have been it, my mind would have just exploded watching all of this stuff so I think it's an essential addition to the TurboGrafx 16 mini and I definitely want to find the time to go back and dive further and further into this experience I'm gonna give these book one and two an eight out of ten All right, now we switch over to the PC Engine side of the TurboGrafx-16 Mini, and these are Japanese games, clearly, uh, but most of them are totally fine to play in English. We're going to start with number 26, and this is a classic. It's Akumajo Dracula X Chi no Rondo, or Rondo of Blood in English. This is a classic Castlevania game, an excellent addition to this TurboGrafx-16 Mini collection. So fun to play. It's incredibly challenging, incredibly difficult. I had uh, somebody comment on our channel that this is harder than Dark Souls, uh, but it's so beautiful, and it's filled with such great production values that you're going to want to go back and play this again and again. This one came out in uh, 1993 from Konami, and it is a exquisite. It's one of the best things in this entire collection. Gets a 9.5 out of 10 from me. Number 27 is All Deans. This one was uh, developed by Hudson Soft, brought out on the machine in 1991, and this game looks terrific. It's another shooter. It's a horizontal shooter, uh, and you've got all kinds of great enemies coming at you. I love the pseudo 3D kind of quality of the art uh, when you're tilting your ships around. Everything looks and pops off the screen so well. I love the little crab tanks that erupt out of the ground. This is a very fun, very confident shooter. Hudson Soft was killing it making these games, and uh, I really liked Aldeans a lot. 8.5 out of 10 for me. Number 28 is Apurai Gate Ball. It came out from Hudson Soft in 1988. I don't know what the hell is going on in this game at all. It looks like it's some kind of croquet type thing. Uh, it's all in Japanese, so I don't know what I'm reading. I'm clicking on buttons, and every once in a while, something moves and the ball gets hit. Uh, I would never play this, though. So I'm not even going to score it. Number 29 is another Bomberman game. It's Bomberman 94. It came out in, uh, I guess, 1993 from Hudson Soft. So maybe they, they finished Bomberman 93 and then got right to work on this one. And one of the things you could certainly levy at the Bomberman games is they made too many of them and they kind of overstayed their welcome. Uh, but there is an incredible pull with these titles. They're very addictive. It's very fun to play these things. They extended the, uh, the storytelling in the game and the world building of the game so that level weren't just confined to one screen you could actually leave the screen and go into different areas there were also other objectives planted into the 94 as well it's not just clear the enemies it's clear the enemies and unlock the the, the sort of portal to the next phase and you're finding little artifacts and you're basically completing missions there was a lot more added to make this game uh, you, you know feel more fulfilling than you're just clearing boards 
I love this game, and uh, even though I've played way too many Bomberman games in my life, it's still a treat to go back to them, and especially when you go back to the, you know, before they had sort of overdone it, you know? Bomberman 94 is awesome, and even though, you know, all the storytelling and stuff is in Japanese, you don't, doesn't really matter. You're still gonna have a blast playing this game. An 8.5 out of 10. Number 30 is Bomberman Panic Bomber, and this was developed by Hudson Soft and brought to the machine in 1994, so this was way late in the PC Engine's life cycle. And this is a different type of game. It's a puzzle game, a little bit like uh, Puyo Puyo, where you've got all kinds of different shapes coming down from the uh, top screen, gravity style, and sometimes you've got bombs that come down to help you clear the board. You're trying to defeat your opponent on the other side, and you're progressing from level to level, and of course the challenge is gonna ramp up. I've played a ton of these gravity puzzlers and it's when I go and I jump into one of these things, it's never from a place of like, oh, look at how inventive it is. It's like, oh yeah, okay, I remember this. This, this kind of gameplay is very fun. I'm glad that it's there. I know that there's lots of hardcore fans for puzzle games like this, but personally, I've kind of had my fill though. I'm gonna give Bomberman Panic Bomber a seven out of 10. Number 31 is a weird one. It's called Cho Anki. It came out in 1992 from NCS. And uh, this one uh, stars what looks like a, like a couple of superheroes or some kind of mystical hero type creations and you've got to fight all kinds of weird bad guys and uh, you know lots of weird imagery like little stone heads and things like that flying at you um, the mechanics aren't perfect so it felt a little bit cheap it felt like I was getting hit when I, I didn't really feel like I should have been hit um, but th the weird thing is is that when you are killed and you've last lost your last life the continue screen is a bunch of uh, n nearly naked dudes doing all kinds of sort of muscle poses in between things and from what I understand I, I read up on this a little bit this series went on and on and on and got weirder and weirder over time i don't know if this was the first one or not but um it's it's suitably weird uh it's definitely an in, you know a, a nice curiosity to to examine as you're digging into your library here but I, I don't know there's way better action experiences on this thing i'm gonna give cho anki a five out of ten number 32 is daima kaimura otherwise known as ghouls and ghosts it's capcom's classic NEC brought it to the uh, PC Engine in 1990, and this is an excellent port of an incredibly difficult but rewarding game. Uh, you've got to, you know, get to the end of the game and take care of all kinds of bad guys and little, you know, magical creatures that will turn you into a frog or something like that or a, a duck. Uh, and you've got to keep your armor on. You've got to try to, you know, battle for as long as you can before all of your uh, stuff is lost and you're racing around in your underwear. Very tuned mechanics, beautiful background art and animation in this game, and a lovely port. There, you know, you could argue there are better ports for the Genesis or the Super Nintendo, but this looks great for PC Engine, and I'm so glad that it's part of this collection. Nine out of ten. Number 33 is Dragon Spirit, and I was so happy to discover this in the collection here. This is developed by Namco. It came out in 1988, and it's a shooter, a vertical shooter, a lot like Namco's classic exhibit. Xevious, but this time you're playing as dragons and you're flying up the screen and you can get uh, power-ups like getting giving yourself more heads on your dragon which gives you more firepower at literal firepower because they're dragons uh they're great graphics you know a great challenge the sprites are big though you're you the dragon sprite is large so you're easy to get slammed by all the projectiles that are crossing the screen i just love the whole aesthetic and just the idea of being a badass dragon flying around and blasting at all kinds of air and land targets Awesome, I love this in the collection. Gets a nine out of 10 from me. Number 34 is Dungeon Explorer. It's uh, the Japanese version of Dungeon Explorer. Came out in 1989 on the PC Engine. It's Japanese. I would play the English version of this game. Number 35 is Fantasy Zone, which NEC Avenue brought to the PC Engine in 1988. It's based on an arcade game from Sega in 1986. And uh, this is a very cutesy, colorful, cartoony shooter uh, where you play a little spaceship that has wings and you can buy all kinds of power-ups and you're blasting all kinds of enemies. It, it kind of has a vibe like Defender, uh, where you're cruising across the screen and you'll eventually lap around the screen. Enemies are going to come from all areas and they're going to be all shapes and sizes and the power-ups that you uh, kind of, uh, you know, attach to your ship are very fun. 
this is a great game. It's definitely addictive, and it's also incredibly challenging, even though it's so cutesy and accommodating. And it's a great port on the uh, PC Engine as well. And one of the cool things is you can actually unlock a near arcade perfect version of this as well, which uh, makes this pretty hard to pass up. I'm giving Fantasy Zone an 8.5 out of 10. Number 36 is Galaga 88, which Namco brought to the PC Engine in 1988. And uh, this is an update to a classic, one of the stalwart old arcade experiences that kind of really solidified the importance of arcade entertainment. Uh, you know, you're basically at the bottom of the screen blasting at all kinds of bad guys that were above you. And one of the cool hooks of the game is that one of the ships could grab your ship, pull it up into uh, the formation of the enemy ships, and then you could blast that ship and then become two ships and then it'd be twice as powerful. Uh, there's new embellishments here and cool music. Bad guys will explode in fireworks and there's cool background art and stuff here. It's still at its core though, a lot of that classic Galaga gameplay, which is timeless and still super fun in 2020. Galaga 88 gets an appropriate eight out of 10. Number 37 is one of the highlights of the collection here. I'll try this in Japanese here. It's Hai Ha Fukui Densetsu Sapphire. It's from Hudson in 1995, and you actually needed an arcade card and you know all kinds of special attachments in order to play this game when it came out. It's the most expensive Turbo Graphics or PC Engine game that you can pick up out there. It's incredibly collectible, so it's awesome that it's included on this disc. It's a uh, it's an amazing shooter that uh, uses all kinds of state of the art for its time technology. So you get all kinds of holographic art in the background. You're part of this police force, an all-woman police force, uh, flying. It's like Blade Runner, so you're seeing a lot of imagery like holograms on buildings and things like that. Great soundtrack, great visuals, lots of really cool technology on display. But beyond all of that, it's crazy fun. Hudson knew exactly what they were doing by 1995 with this kind of stuff, and they wanted to show off what they were capable of, and boy did they ever. Sapphire is awesome, and it's definitely one of the best games you can play in here. Nine out of 10. Number 38 is the 1985 Konami arcade classic Gradius, which came out on the uh, PC Engine in 1991. Uh, we've played this game many times over the years. You're, it's a horizontal scrolling shooter, and you've got all kinds of power-ups that you can pick up. There's lots of uh, different choices that you can make on when you're gonna pick up your power-ups and when you're gonna spend that currency to unlock missiles and the ability to fire in multiple directions or to give you a little bit more speed. Uh, very elegant and a very, very good port to the TurboGrafx-16, but there's also a near arcade perfect version that you can unlock on here as well. And uh, super fun. It's it's a little creaky because it's been around for a long time, but it's still ridiculously fun. A great solid shooter. Eight out of 10 for Gradius. Number 39 is Gradius 2, which came out in 1992, and it was a CD, it's the CD version of the game, so better sound, better music. You've got an enhanced selection of different power-up choices that you can choose at the beginning, which gives you a lot of strategy every time that you replay the game. I thought one of the weird things about this game is that for the uh, high score list at the end, you actually punch in your age and your gender, and it puts in all of that data at the end when it's flashing uh, the highest scores for the day. I thought that was pretty crazy. Definitely an excellent addition on this collection, though. I'm giving Gradius 2 an 8.5 out of 10. Number 40 is Necromancer, developed by Hudson Soft, came out for the PC Engine in 1988. It's very crude looking. It's all in Japanese. I don't know what's going on. I sense it's some kind of RPG, but I don't know. I couldn't play it. 41 is the Japanese version of Military Madness called Nectaris, developed by Hudson Soft in 1989. I wouldn't play that, I'd play Military Madness. Number 42 is Newtopia from Hudson Soft in 1989. It's all in Japanese. I'd play the English version. Newtopia 2 in Japanese is also on here. I wouldn't play that, I'd play the English version. Number 44 is Ninja Ryu Kenden or Gaiden, Tecmo's classic 1988 arcade game, which was ported to the PC Engine by Hudson Soft in 1992. And they did an excellent job with the conversion. This is a great game, incredibly challenging. Uh, um, you know, it's it, it's not incredibly deep. Uh, so you're just basically going along one plane and you're using your blade to try to deal with all the bad guys that are coming at you. And of course, there's great power-ups, you know, all kinds of shurikens and flame effects. 
And bad guys are ruthless, so this is an incredibly challenging but unbelievably fun and rewarding game. And also because of its classic roots, it's such an awesome addition to this collection. Gets an 8.5 out of 10 for me. Number 45 is PC Genjin, or Bonk's Adventure, which came out in 1989 from Hudson Soft. And this is a seminal game. For me, it really defined what the Turbo Graphics was, or the PC Engine was. Uh, this cute little caveman character that bonks everybody with his head and uh, eats all kinds of fruits and, and then eventually meat to power up and, and go beat red and take out all kinds of bad guys. You're doing a little bit of swimming and some, some puzzle solving and some platform jumping and hopping. Beautiful music, great, super detailed characters. I have this for my Turbo Express and every time I turned it on, I'd have a huge smile on my face. It's just so charming and it's it had to be here and I'm so glad that it is. It's weird that we don't get all the Bonks games in English, but I'm just glad that this game is here at least to play. You don't really need to read this game to have a great time with it. Nine out of 10. Number 46 is a classic and important shooter from Konami. It was uh, in the arcades in 1986 and ported to the PC Engine in 1991. It's called Salamander, and it's from the Gradius kind of school of game design. You can kind of feel a little bit of the Gradius sort of elements in here. Lots of great power-ups and wingmen that you can pick up. It switches, though. It's not all horizontal. There's vertical sections as well. Uh, it's very elaborate and very addictive and very challenging and very fun, but the cool thing with this game is you can unlock a near arcade perfect version of the title and there are also a couple of other classic konami games that you can unlock if you put in the right button sequence uh, before you start salamander off but salamander in its own right is a terrific game and it's a great shooter surrounded by lots of other great shooters I'm giving it an 8.5 out of 10. And as far as the other games that you can unlock, you can unlock Twin B, which was kind of like Exevious, Konami's answer to Exevious, but everything is much more cutesy and colorful, sort of in the vein of Fantasy Zone. Very fun, very addictive, also incredibly challenging. That one gets an 8 out of 10. And there's also Force Gear, which is another Konami shooter, which is not, a, you know, overly memorable. There's so many good shooters in this collection that uh, the okay ones don't really stand out that much, uh, but this is definitely a competent game. You, you're in a mech and it can transform and fly and shoot all kinds of cool weaponry and there's great power-ups and stuff. But by the time I played Force Gear, I might have been a little bit exhausted on how many great shooters I was playing. So I, I wasn't blown away, but it's definitely a fun game to play. And it's great that it's just a hidden gem in there. Seven out of 10 for Force Gear. And speaking of awesome shooters, number 50 is Series Senshi Spriggan from Naxat and Compile in 1991. And in this one, you're playing uh, characters that are inside these giant mech suits. It's a vertical shooter, uh, lots of great power-ups, lots of great enemies to take out. One of the ones that stood out for me were these flying skull creations that were blasting all kinds of uh, weaponry down at you. I was really impressed with the feel and the flow and the look of this game. Definitely a very solid experience. Series Senshi Spriggan gets an 8 out of 10 for me. Number 51 is Snatcher from Konami in 1992. This was developed by Hideo Kojima. It's his uh, cyberpunk classic. I've never played Snatcher. I was really looking forward to checking this out, but it's all in Japanese, so I can't play it and I'm bummed about that. Number 52 is Spriggan Mark II from Naxat and Compile, which came out in 1992, and they switched the perspective on this one. It's a horizontal shooter, lots of great shifts and bad guys to blow away, but the game felt a little bit more clunky and not as fast, not as fun and fluid as the first Spriggan game is. And, you know, even though there's some really cool production elements in here with cut sequences, animated cutscenes, and there's lots of dialogue going back and forth as you're in the middle of battle, there's some nice, you know, ambition on display. It's just not designed as um, expertly as some of the other way better shooters are in this collection. I'm going to give Spriggan Mark II a 6.5 out of 10. Number 53 is one of my favorite games in the entire collection. It's called Star Parodier. It came out in 1992 from Hudson Soft. And this is a, another vertical shooter. I know you've heard that a lot from me today. Uh, but this time you're not just playing a spaceship. You can be a spaceship, but you can also be a giant bomber man spaceship or a giant PC engine, a console spaceship. And as the, the PC engine, you actually pick up hue cards along the way as part of your power-ups. And you've got, you know, weapons that blast in every single direction. And you've got cutesy bad guys and bosses to fight against. It's filled with charm, great art style, and incredibly fun and very tuned. You know, I mean, Hudson Soft was making so many games at that time that they were able to just, you know, nail it. Even when they were having a laugh, it felt like. But Star Parodier is excellent, and it's one of my favorite games on this whole collection. 9.5 
out of 10. Number 54 is another shooter. It's Super Darius. This one was out in 1990 from NEC porting a Taito arcade classic. And uh, this is incredibly challenging, navigating tiny little caverns and uh, you know bad guys in every kind of nook and cranny shooting at you. So you're gonna be dealing with bullet hell and bad guys everywhere. Sometimes they're massive and their flight patterns are, are gonna drive you a little bit insane, but you feel like such a badass for surviving and getting deeper and deeper and further into it. It's tuned, it's very fun, but yes, you're gonna be swearing as you play Super Darius. It gets an 8.5 out of 10 for me. Number 55 is Super Momotaro Dentetsu 2. This is from Hudson Soft in 1991. Looks like it's some kind of a, a train-based um, uh, board game. I didn't know what was going on. Looks cute though, but I couldn't play it. It's all in Japanese. Number 56 is Super Star Soldier. This was developed by Hudson Soft and brought to the PC Engine in 1990. It is the prequel to Soldier Blade, which is the English language game on the TurboGrafx side. Uh, Super Star Soldier is a lot of fun. It has a lot of similar elements that you'll see in Soldier Blade, vertical shooter with lots of great power-ups, lots of enemies to take out. I found that I got hooked on a, uh, a green power-up that I didn't dig that much, and I felt like I couldn't avoid it. I kept grabbing it, and I, it's just had this, uh, this kind of lame electrical bolt, which would take out all the enemies, but there were some wave and pulse weapons that would just fill the screen with shots, and I felt Felt like so much more of a badass. It's kind of a hard thing to nitpick, but when you're dealing with this flood of shooters that I've been playing, that's the thing that stands out the most about Superstar Soldier. Definitely worth playing, but I feel it might get lost in and amongst some of the standouts here. But I'm gonna give Superstar Soldier an eight out of 10. Number 57 is the Genji and the Heike Clans. This is based on a uh, Namco arcade game from 1986. It was ported to the PC Engine in 1990. It's an ancient looking and playing hack and slash action game. Uh, it, it, you know, an interesting, again, sort of artifact that you can dig into, but there have just been so many better playing action experiences than this. I don't quite know what the story is because it's all in Japanese, but uh, you know, interesting not for me to really get lost in. I'm gonna give it a five out of 10. Number 58 is the Kung Fu, which came out in 1987, developed by Hudson Soft. And I have to tell you that the uh, the pecs on our shirtless hero, it's kind of hypnotic watching as they move, as he's walking. Uh, you're kind of pushed along in this horizontal scroll and you'll see that the sprite of this character is so massive and it's so weird, like you're punching birds and, and kicking at goons and stuff and things just disappear off the screen. And eventually you're pushed along until you fight a bad guy um, and they kind of knock him out in a in a very um, underwhelming way uh, but you know there's something I don't know kind of compelling about this game it's certainly the roots of brawlers it's like early early days here and we've played way better beat-em-ups on lots of other platforms uh, but I don't know if there was there was something kind of unique about this game that made me want to play it and uh, you know I dug this accentuated art style of this title as well. I'm gonna give it a 6.5 out of 10. The Legend of Valkyrie is on this collection. It's number 59. It came out in 1986 in arcades and it was ported to the PC Engine in 1990. Namco made this game and uh, it's very fun to play. You play this Valkyrie warrior that can blast in a bunch of different directions, has a sword as well. Lots of different enemies coming at you in every way. So it almost feels like a hybrid of a shooter fused with a you know an adventure game of some kind. Uh, you're saving innocence and doling out punishment to the bad guys, trying not to fall off of edges and stuff. All of that language sounds a lot more elaborate than the actual archaic visuals of this game appear to be, uh, but there is still some real fun to be had with this game. I was very impressed with it. I don't remember playing this back in the day, but uh, I certainly respect its, uh, its quality even many, many decades later, and I also respect its positioning in this collection. It's, it's definitely worth your time. I'm gonna give it a 7.5 out of 10. And number 60, as far as games that I've been able to find so far on the TurboGrafx-16 Mini is the Japanese version of Ease Book 1 and 2, which is cool, but I don't know what I'm reading, so of course I would play the English versions of those games. And honestly, there are nine games that I wouldn't play in this collection, mostly because they're Japanese or they're duplicates in Japanese. So, out of 60 games that are included on here, 51 of them are definitely worth checking out, 
And uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'll put together a first five video, my first five picks from this massive collection, and uh, I'll tell you why I chose those games. But overall, you know, I've already given this whole collection and this hardware a 9 out of 10. I think it absolutely deserves that. And now that you've seen all my mini reviews for all of these games, you can see why I'm such a big fan of the TurboGrafx-16 Mini. This is a terrific mini console. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching today. We're going to be back with new content for you very soon. In the meantime, make sure you check out all of the previous content that we put up. And if you dig our stuff, hit that subscribe button. If you like this video, hit the like button. Go ahead and share it. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you soon. And until then, play forever.